we have a diverse group of both local and national experts here uh, that have come tonight to discuss drones and what we should do as a community. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator, Steve Dean. Uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure, have read his columns here. Uh, I, f I find him to be the lead columnist uh, in the state of Oregon, and he's done that for many decades, taking on the last columnist, uh, uh, sadly. Uh, we, we still barely have a, a print edition of the Oregonian, but um, uh, Steve uh, has covered all kinds of topics here for decades. Family life, uh, he's delved into the comic book industry, uh, leadership, uh, I love his book, um, challenge uh, that he gets young people to read uh, books. Uh, he's covered all kinds of sporting things. Uh, in fact, his latest uh, novel is about competitive teen sports, uh, The Less We Touch. And without further ado, I am fresh off of two weeks of vacation on Figure Eight Island on the North Carolina coast. Um, that's the summer home of John Edwards, and several million fiddler crabs. My brother-in-law also has a place there, and his family always welcomes mine with an energetic set of toys, uh, jet skis. Uh, this summer we had the Bug Assault, which is a toy firearm that obliterates flying insects on the patio with rock salt. Believe me, nine times out of 10, the fly is a lot smarter than the bug assault, so it's a total waste of time. But also this summer, they had a drone, straight out of the mail order catalog, not much bigger than an oversized Frisbee, sent aloft with a 30 minute battery and a GPS system, excuse me, and a cell phone app, and packing a camera for aerial shots and a GPS system that brings the drone back to the launch pad if and when all else fails. And as I watched, my 19-year-old nephew is piloting this drone off the back deck of the house and over the Atlantic. He's sending it up into the formation of pelicans that ride the warm summer air coming off the roofs of the beach houses. He's tracking the thunderstorms that roll up the inland passage from Wilmington, North Carolina. He's sending this sucker up 1,500 feet in the air. Until that moment, I was clueless about drones. I never imagined them to weigh three to five pounds. I knew Hamas has them and Amazon wants them. But I never realized you could add them so casually to the backyard barbecue paraphernalia. Most of you obviously are way ahead of me. So why are you here tonight? Maybe because the Oregon legislature dropped the ball when it wrestled with these puppies in 2013. Perhaps you're wondering about the balance of opportunity and threat in a world rife with unmanned aerial vehicles. Maybe it's because it's long past time that we gather together for an informative, instructive, interactive discussion about what's happening around us, or maybe just maybe, you realize, as I have, that drones might finally solve the problem of seven-day home delivery. <laughs> Our stage is equipped with four experts who will frame this issue with their opening remarks. You're armed with a note card, which, as Jason said, will allow you to address specific questions to members of our panel. But let's get started. First up, Jennifer Williamson, a Democratic legislator from Portland and the Assistant House Majority Leader. I have no idea what or how often Jennifer thinks about drones. I do know that she helped define, excuse me, design my favorite bill of the 14th special session, one that would have funded legal aid services for Oregon's poor with the unclaimed proceeds from class action lawsuits. Proceeds that now remain. <laughs> Thanks to the legislature, by the way, those proceeds now remain with our heroes 
at BP and the tobacco industry. But that said, Jennifer. Thank you, Steve. Um, it was my favorite bill of the 2014 legislative session as well. So we share at least that. Um, I, I found your opening story interesting because I had a kind of similar experience when one day I got a text message from a coworker of mine and it was a picture and he, and he had worked on the legislation in the 2013 um, session around drones and warrants that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. But he said, check out what you can buy at Fred Meyer. And it was a picture of a $149.99 unmanned aerial vehicle. And he said, should we get one for the halls of the Capitol? And it was, that was the first time that I'd actually seen even a picture of it. And I walked down to Stadium Fred Meyer and checked it out. And sure enough, you could, there were three or four of them there that you could buy. And it was just a reminder of how quickly technology is moving and how slowly policy, as policymakers, we can respond to these kinds of technological advancements. So I really see my role in this conversation as the person who, and representing the body who needs to make sure that as policymakers, we are having a balanced, open conversation about how we protect Oregonians, how we protect our privacy, how we think about the economic uh, growth opportunities in an industry that is that we don't even know how far it could take us. What our infrastructure needs are, we're creating, I think about it as the roadways of the sky. We don't even know what kind of infrastructure questions we should be asking as policymakers. So what I know is that we need to be engaged and active in a conversation about who are the stakeholders, who needs to be at the table when we're talking about legislation, and how do we, how do we even think about creating policy in this arena? So what have we done? Steve mentioned in 2013, we passed a bill, House Bill 2710, that came out of a bipartisan group of legislators who were mostly concerned, frankly, about warrantless searches by law enforcement. So it was my understanding that um, we had some law enforcement agencies in Oregon who had received grants from Homeland Security at the national level to buy unmanned aerial vehicles to use in law enforcement um, activities. And part of the agreement with getting those dollars was that they didn't disclose to anyone that they had that technology. And that, that, is, that it, this is not the only technology that has been funded in that way. So I actually don't even know if that's the case. That's how it trickled down to me and that I wasn't supposed to necessarily know about it. So working in the House with Representative Huffman, who's from the Gorge, a Republican, he and I worked with a group of legislators on what does it look like to, to at least get a warrant requirement for drones. So treat drones like we do any other kind of information collecting um, function of law enforcement, whether it's you know, now searching your cell phone, thanks to the Supreme Court, you need a warrant for that, but at the time we didn't even need a warrant for that but taking pictures, searching your house, searching your car, having to follow the same kind of rules if a law enforcement drone came over your property and you know, could see into your windows and the like. And so being able to put some sideboards around that, uh, we got done in 2013. In addition, the bill did a couple of things. Um, it requires that, that public agencies register their drones to the Oregon Aviation Board, and part of that is to figure out what's out there. We can't regulate it. We can't have a public policy conversation if we don't even know who has what and what they're using it for. So, um, and the, the Aviation Board will be giving us an annual report on who's out there and what they're using their equipment for. It, our, the bill preempts local law enforcement from regulating drones. Part of the concern at the state level that we had is different jurisdictions, whether it was a county or a city, uh, creating their own infrastructure, their own rules, instead of taking a step back and saying, what are we gonna do for the state? So that, so that law preempted local governments from regulating drones. We also limited what uh, local governments and public bodies could use the information that they got with drones. So for example, Oregon State University was very um, concerned about us limiting the use of public bodies uh, in, using, in using drones because they use them in research in agricultural areas where they physically can't get to the places that, that they have test sites. 
and they wanted to make sure that they would still be able to do their research and that the farmers that they work with would be able to get to their, um, their fields way out in the middle of nowhere in a, in a very efficient and cost-effective manner. And so we worked with folks like OHS, or, um, OSU to make sure that those kinds of legitimate uses um, were still available to them, but we limited how public agencies could use the information that they, they got from those drones. So if OSU was out surveying fields and maybe, oh, I don't know, flew across a big pot grow, that you know their ability to turn that over to law enforcement without a warrant and without going through the proper, proper channels, we limited that. So they would have to do what they'd have to do in any other situation, in a uh, law enforcement situation, if they were to give that information over to law enforcement. Uh, we prohibited public bodies from arming drones. So however, however the technology advances, that was something that we wanted to be out in front of, that to not have public safety um, organizations, whether it be sheriff, police departments, state police, at this point, there is, they, they are pre, uh, prohibited from arming drones in any way in the state of Oregon. And finally, it was, um, like I said, that the biggest issue was limiting how law enforcement could use information. So in addition to the warrant requirement, they're not um, allowed to acquire information unless they are they are um, expressly authorized by statute. So at least the legislature has to get in front of how uh, law enforcement will collect information with drones. Because part of the issue we have is technology moves so quickly and the legislative process by design is a slower process. And so we really meet in long sessions every two years. We are not, um, you know, we are not out necessarily in industries like this kind of technology industry. So we rely on experts in the field, but just the nature, the nature of the beast is slow moving. And so as things move quickly, we can't respond. I was telling someone earlier that a friend of mine argued the Supreme Court case around cell phone searches. And he said, you know, doing the case law research, there was case law on desktop computers and now on cell phones, but technology moved so quickly that there was nothing on laptops because the case had just hadn't made it through the system yet. And so when we're looking at old, slower systems in our, in our public policy arena and um, quickly moving technology, it's hard for us to keep up. So where are we going? That's a great question and I hope we answer that tonight um, because it, it, it's hard to tell where we're going. My biggest concerns, like I said, is, is how do we think about infrastructure? So. If you look just at the roads in Portland, you've got the State Department of Transportation that are in charge of some portions of the road. The city, PBOT, um, Portland Transportation is in charge of some. If you drive across a, a, a bridge, the county controls it. And so if we could recreate an infrastructure regulatory system right now, what would that look like? Because that's what we have to do. And so I'm very concerned about that. I'm concerned about how we encourage an industry that Oregon is uniquely uh, situated to grow. So if, if the unmanned aerial vehicle uh, industry is growing, I know that we have clusters in Oregon and Bend and in the Gorge where we're leading the, we're leading the, the nation in development of these technologies. So how do we encourage that kind of economic growth in an industry that is taking off? Um, while protecting Oregonians and protecting um, our privacy and and our, um, our, our own personal space in a way that we've not had to think about before. So hopefully we'll answer all those questions tonight. <laughs> Make my job a lot easier in Salem. So thank you all for coming and participating in what I'm sure will be a long conversation about what we need to be doing in Oregon. So thank you. And again, like I said, he has done operations work above the Arctic Circle and in post-earthquake Haiti, which pretty much circumscribes fire and ice. And he's also established flight and test patterns for the Naval Air Weapons Center in China Lake, California. He runs virtual data operations support and lives in Corvallis. Brian. Thank you. And uh, for now, your job is safe. As, the, uh, as an editor, I think the drones aren't quite ready to do that yet, but uh, you'll be fine for a while. Uh, it's unique to be here, and, and I thank everyone in the audience for coming. Um, as an industry representative, one of the things that we're 
trying to struggle with and make sure that we do properly is how to integrate this technology into the national airspace. And it's of great concern to all of us who are a part of this industry and trying to do things correctly. Uh, as an association, uh, we represent both the government and civilian side. My company is focused more on the civilian and commercial application of the technology. Uh, and we have done some unique work uh, pretty much in, in all the different climates you can, you can think of. Um, I did bring a, a picture, just a little show and tell, and anyone's welcome to go look uh, at, at an example of sort of what a drone or an unmanned aircraft is capable uh, typically of, of generating from a resolution standpoint. Because one of the things that's really important to understand when we talk about the technology is sort of the, the disparity between you know, fic, uh, faction, uh, fact and, real, and uh, fiction. Um, there's a lot of fear, and I think the fear is justified, but then there's also the reality of what these sensors can do and where the technology is going. Um, and so if you have time, please take a look, because that's a good example of, of a super high resolution camera that we used up in the Arctic Circle, uh, and it's of missions that we're doing where we do environmental monitoring and compliance support, uh, doing things like polar bear monitoring, uh, marine mammal monitoring, sea ice monitoring. And in that one picture, there, I think there's eight polar bears, 182 walrus, and a bunch of seals. And it's a great example of how to use the technology in a way that uh, people haven't traditionally thought. Right now, we're forced to use, it to, to use manned aircraft up in the Arctic um, because the laws don't really support us to go unmanned, although we're, we're actually trying to make that happen. But the reason why we're trying to go unmanned up there is because imagine putting eight or ten people over the Arctic Ocean, and if we have a mishap up there, you've got ten people that are now uh, probably not going to survive that impact. So it's a great place to use this technology and a great example of how to apply it. Uh, in Haiti, we were one of the first companies to actually go in and help disaster support post-earthquake. Uh, we were asked to go down and actually uh, document a couple of orphanages that had uh, lost contact with their U.S. support. Uh, I was working for a different company at the time. We used some of our infrastructure support that got us down there. Uh, fortunately, the, the actual orphanages were fine. Uh, they were made of wood and they weren't in the Port-au-Prince. They were up in the hills and so they didn't really need uh, any assistance. But what we did find was a great use for the technology was we went out and we started to map the infrastructure and where the roads were broken, the bridges were down, and what you can see from the air is that you can start to see where people are gathering behind the walls, behind the buildings that you can't see when you're driving down a road. And we then used that imagery to collect and we gave it directly to the relief workers who then could build their own relief uh, uh, scheme on how they wanted to respond appropriately to where the people were massing and things like that. So the technology's got amazing applications. Um, I think where the fear comes in, and I think what the Colonel's going to address, is how sometimes the technology can be used in a way that, that um, doesn't have such a humanitarian phase to it. Uh, one of the things that I did when I was working for the Navy uh, at China Lake is we looked in the year 2025 and beyond, and we tried to figure out what the future was going to look like and then help the Navy develop the, the acquisition cycles to, to counter those future threats. And it was pretty obvious at the time that the future was going unmanned. So as much as we, as a nation, may want to hold back and, and figure out how are we going to apply this technology. We have to honor the fact as well, though, that the rest of the world isn't necessarily going to have the same ethical boundaries and concerns. And we're fortunate to live in a country where we can hold our politicians and people accountable to, to the decisions that they make. But it's, it's an amazing time that we live in as we look down the road and we look where technology is going. It, it's, it could have a potentially scary future. And I think by having the you know, representative here and by having the awareness from the political uh, leadership now, we really need to start to focus in on that ethical boundary of how to use a technology, how to incorporate it, where are we going in the future when all of our technology is, is networked up. And the, the UAV or the drone has kind of become the poster child for that fear and that concern, but it, it's bigger than just the UAV. In the future, it's gonna be all of our cars, our dishwashers. You know, we already know about our cell phones. And so I think the fear and the concern about privacy is a bigger picture than just the, the quote unquote drone but it's the same mindset and that we have to start to address these issues now because looking in the future, it's only going to get easier to abuse the technology and to use it for ways that it was never intended to use. And, and that's one of the really important discussion items, I think, to get out of here is, yes, we're here to talk about drones, but the application of the technology can be applied in many different ways. And when we start to write laws and legislation, we need to address those changes and how things are going to uh, be integrated in the future. And that's an important piece of, of what's going to happen. Um, as an industry, uh, it is an amazing industry to be a part of. It, there's tremendous growth and a lot of excitement on what's going on, we, and we're still trying to figure things out. Uh, we had a big meeting today where we're working with in, insurance uh, leaders 
uh, AIG and Global and a couple of others who are trying to figure out how to insure uh, and what are going to be the standards to operate so that you can be insured and things like that. So as an industry, we're still trying to figure this out and incorporate the proper rules and mechanics behind uh, incorporating what we hope is going to become a blossoming uh, uh, future for, for the technology that's being developed. Here in Oregon, uh, we're a unique state uh, for a lot of different reasons. One, we do have a cluster of the industry that is developing the technology out in Hood River. There are several important companies that are doing some amazing things, building sensors, building the platforms. And really, on the commercial side of the technology, Oregon is one of the leaders, I think, globally in making this technology. And so we have a unique uh, background here with a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, support. So it, it's one of those things that we can't ignore as well, is that it's, you, you can't just ask this technology to go away. It's, it's pretty important to Oregon. Additionally, Oregon, we're uh, one of the designated as one of the six FAA test sites. I don't know if anybody's aware, but uh, there were six te national test sites that the FAA selected. And Oregon, under the University of Alaska, is one of those six test sites. And here in Oregon, we've got Pendleton, Warm Springs, and out in Tillamook. And those are areas where we have special approval authority from the FAA on where, how to test systems. Um, that is something, again, where we're literally writing the laws and writing the integration plans on how to use the technology, what are going to be the standards from a pilot perspective, what are the insurance requirements, what are the propulsion requirements, how robust does a system have, how do we deal with EMI, which is electromagnetic interference. All these foundational building blocks are things that we're dealing with right now. So it's a really important time to get input. It's a really important time to work with our leaders because this industry is just in its infancy. It's got tremendous potential, and we're trying to figure this out. And uh, I look forward to the questions, and I uh, will answer anything. And, and the best way I can is one of the few people I think that's really flown a lot of different systems. Uh, I'd be happy to share my experiences in any way I can. So, thank you. Peter Lumsdane has worked and traveled extensively with Global Exchange and the Resource Center for Nonviolence, work that has taken him inside US strategic command bases aerospace factories, and war zones in the Philippines, Mexico, and occupied Iraq. He is the founder of AROES, the Alliance to Resist Robotic Warfare and Society. Peter. Thank you, Steve. Um, I just want to start by thanking Steve and Jennifer and Brian and Anne, and also uh, Jason and Trudy and everybody who really worked very hard putting this event together. And uh, last but not at all least, all of you who are sitting here because um, as Steve said at the beginning, I think it's long past time that we came together in a, a forum like this, and I look forward to your questions and your comments. <clears throat> I have to apologize in advance. I've been having some <clears throat> trouble with a cough and so forth. Uh, try to keep that under control here this evening. Um, one thing I want to just appreciate that Brian said uh, is that I totally agree that this um, question of drones, drone regulation, drone technology is part of a much bigger picture, and I think that's a very important point that you made. And I understand there is a focus for this evening, and that has its significance. But I believe that part of my job here is to take that focus and set it into a larger context. So I'd like to, to share some thoughts with you and some information along those lines here. Um, and then I, I look forward to hearing what Anne has to say um, after that. Um, I want to start with just two fact points, two data points, uh, which I actually brought up to the uh, reporter that I spoke with a few days ago. And I think she wrote a very good story, but those two data points didn't make it into the story. So one of those had to do with um, FAA licensing of uh, commercial drones that operate over land areas. And as I understand it from the news reports, the FAA recently, within the last couple of months, issued the first full authorization for a uh, commercial drone operation uh, in the commercial realm over uh, terrestrial areas, land bodies. And I think it's interesting, I think it's instructive, uh, perhaps a coincidence, but perhaps an indicator of something else, that that uh, initial license that the FAA issued uh, did not go to resource conservation monitoring, it did not go to finding uh, lost children or forest fire suppression. It was actually issued to a transnational energy corporation, BP, uh, for resource surveys and resource extraction monitoring on the north slope of Alaska. You might remember the name or initials BP from the local gas station or the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico. But I thought it was interesting that that was the FAA's first priority in issuing a commercial um, uh, 
drone operating license over uh, territory. And the other thing that I thought was interesting was actually on the day that I spoke to the reporter uh, on July 31st, USA Today had a little poll, which was a, a national public opinion survey that they published on their front page uh, down in the, the lower left-hand corner. I don't know if any of you saw that. Uh, and it was actually about drone use and who in our society should be authorized to operate drones. And so uh, I thought it was interesting. So 86% of the people who were polled nationally said they thought, yes, at least in some cases, the military uh, should, should be authorized to use uh, some drone technology. And then uh, when they were asked about the police, there was still a majority, but it dropped significantly to 66%. But when it went to commercial enterprises, to profit-making businesses, to corporations, the actual level of support in the country for allowing those entities to operate their own drones was at 36%. So I thought that was kind of interesting as a barometer of uh, where public opinion stands or may stand right now in the United States of America. Um, I want to try to touch on four areas here this evening. And one, as I indicated before, is to try and set the question of drone and drone regulations in context. Brian alluded to this, and I want to, I want to add some information and thoughts on that. Um, second, I want to say some additional things about the corporate commercial sector drones and robotics, because one of the contexts in which drones exist, of course, is the entire technology and industry of robotics, the application to UAVs, as they're called, or uh, RPVs, or whatever the, the alphabet soup acronym might be, uh, to these aerial vehicles, still comes out of the broader development of robotics and the advanced computing AI systems that drive that. So I want to say a little bit about that. Anna's is going to talk about military drones, and so I'm not really going to touch that very much. But what I do want to talk about uh, is the much less noticed area of military ground robotic systems, which are uh, increasing very rapidly in their scope and power and, um, and numbers. Uh, and then the final point is what the implications uh, for our life and our kids and our grandkids in the 21st century of the robotics industry, robotic technology, and its convergence with several other new technologies might be. So uh, that's a lot to cover in whatever it is, 10 minutes that I have, but I'll, I want to just touch on those briefly. Um, in terms of the context, um, you know, I said four years ago in Hood River, Oregon, some of you might have been there uh, at Riverside Church when we had a, a regional conference uh, called Challenging Robotic Warfare and Social Control that I helped to coordinate with Columbia River Fellowship for Peace. And uh, one of the things that I said there, my colleague Marcy Darnovsky particularly noticed, and she said to me, you know, you've got to remember this, Peter, and you've got to say this again. And uh, Marcy actually is the director of the Center for Genetics and Society, so you might wonder why did we ask her to speak um, on the program at a conference on robotics or robotic warfare and social control. And I'm going to get to that in the last section and how biological science and biotechnology is, uh, is moving closer and closer to robotics and the robotics industry. Marcy talked about this. She talked about DARPA. I don't know how many of you are familiar with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, uh, very important cutting edge, um, partially public, partly black budget Pentagon research agency. Uh, you might have heard about the driverless car contest in the Mojave Desert. Uh, some people have ID DARPA as the original um, inventors of the internet through the ARPANET and so forth. Anyway, it's a very important agency, and Marcy talked about that. But the thing that she said, and how they're involved in both biology and computer science and robotics and how those all fit together, the human enhancement program in the military. But what Marcy said to me, she said, you know, you've got to repeat this, Peter, because I said at that conference, and I say it again tonight, that drones, or rather I should say, the iceberg of which drones are probably one of the most visible tips is not a new issue, it's not another issue, it's not an issue at all. It's a new era in human and planetary history which will affect every issue that we are concerned about from employment and labor rights to agriculture and the environment, ecosystem balance, the conduct of war, the prospects for peace, and in fact, the definition of what uh, it means to be human and what it means to be alive. So, um, just touching on a few points briefly here, um, 
You know, I ta I have talked recently both to uh, people in agriculture, uh, South Dakota farm family, also to uh, some folks in the machinist union at Boeing. I live right across the channel from the Everett Boeing plant up in, in Washington. And in both of those areas, you know, I got a very sharp sense of people being overwhelmed by the pace of change that's taking place uh, in the farms of the Midwest and on the shop floors of our industrial base. And, uh, you know, a lot of this is being very rapidly automated. And the guy I talked to at Boeing actually was in charge of retraining people uh, for the new robotic automation systems that are coming online with the new aircraft manufacturing. And I said, well, you think that as, as many jobs will be created through these new programs as the ones that were lost by automation? And he said, well, at first that might be true, but we have to face the reality that in the end, we are going to lose jobs, we're going to lose base, we're going to lose union members, we're going to lose bargaining power. Boeing isn't officially saying that, but that is what his perception is. So that's something we need to consider. Uh, you know, I, I think we tend to think of ag mechanization as a great thing, but I know when I was at UC Davis, um, there was a lot of concern by small farmers, by co-ops, by farm workers unions about the impact of ag mechanization not making people's lives easier, but eliminating jobs. They're talking about ag drones now, right? We've heard about this. Eliminating people's jobs and forcing people to speed up their rate of work to match the pace of the machines in the fields. So again, we have to look at these questions carefully. Um, environmentally, you just heard probably, I think you heard maybe, about Yellowstone, the, the drone crashing into one of the geysers there. This is just a tiny indicator of so many ways uh, the, the birds off the coast of North Carolina that Steve referred to about how these machines, these sort of synthetic life forms are going to interact with many other natural life forms in the ecosystem. The minerals that they will require to manufacture vast numbers of robotic and drone devices. Uh, the energy that will be required for that. Um, all of these are things that we need to look at very, very carefully. And on the ground, in the battlefield, leading world experts like P.W. Singer at the Brookings Institution, John Pike, who for almost 20 years was the chief research scientist at the Federation of American Scientists. Uh, you know, John Pike wrote in the Washington Post just four or five years ago, in January of 2009, that very soon the uh, acceleration of robo military robotics on the ground was going to outpace that in the air, and that we would have uh, greater and greater numbers of what he called, this is an international military expert who is not actually even against this stuff, uh, stone cold killer robots on the battlefields of planet Earth uh, in greater and greater numbers. Another point that we need to, to look at very carefully. And I think I want to end in, in this you know, compact window of time we've got here with the way in which robotics is not only accelerating, but it is increasingly interacting or merging with other fields of high technology. Uh, 14 years ago, a guy named Bill Joy wrote an article uh, in Wired magazine called Why the Future doesn't need us. And Bill Joy is not an environmentalist, he's not a Luddite, he's not a peace activist, he's one of the leading software architects on the planet, co-founder of Sun Microsystems Corporation, uh, originator of many key operating systems that we all use in our computer work and so on. And what Bill Joy said, and I'm going to end on this note, uh, at least for right now, and I'll have to, to touch on what I think some of the answers to these things are in the question and discussion period, but I'm just going to end on this note that what Bill Joy said in his essay in Wired Magazine was that as someone who had prospered from uh, and was very skillful at and just loved high technology, that he had come to the very, very reluctant conclusion that it was pointing in directions in the 21st century which cast a serious shadow over the well-being and even the survival of the human race and other natural life forms on the earth as robotics. Artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and nanotech accelerate and merge with each other, echoed as recently as May 1st of this year, in the UK, independent, by another fringe anti-science Luddite, Dr. Stephen Hawking, uh, who noted that as is dramatized in the film Transcendence, we are on the brink of a artificial intelligence revolution, which he said might represent the greatest technological breakthrough of the human race, our most stunning achievement, and possibly our last. So I can't go into the detail here, but I just want to put these seeds out for your consideration about the scope and the implications of not only drones, but the technologies to which drones are connected and which they're deeply embedded. And I hope that when we get to the discussion, we can talk a lot more about how we can respond 
in creative and committed ways to these challenges that we face. Thank you. Anne Wright is a former U.S. Army colonel with an extensive career challenging authority, State Department diplomats, and as part of the 2010 Gaza Freedom Flotilla Israeli blockades. On the eve of the 2003 invasion of Iraq, she sent her letter of recommendation to Secretary of State Colin Powell, protesting the imminent onslaught. She has published a book appropriately named Voices of Conscience and speaks frequently on foreign policy. And well, it's a pleasure to be here and let me echo what Peter said to thank all of the uh, coordinators and organizers of, of this event. Uh, there, are, there are groups all over the country that are meeting on exactly this issue. It's very important in terms of uh, our own sensibilities of what we want our society to become. And um, to see the good turnout here in Portland, Oregon, uh, and to have legislators that are here with us to let us know that they're not quite... Uh, uh, you know, the decisions haven't been made and that uh, we, the people, have some impact on, on them. And as we look at civilian uh, use of drones in the civilian environment and for good humanitarian purposes, like Brian talked about some of the environmental things, I'm all for that. I am all for that. As long as we know that those little, those little drones and some of the little bigger drones don't get into the airspace that we are using for other purposes, like commercial uh, air travel. I don't really want to see one of those little things flying right beside my little Delta Airline jet as we're coming out of the airport here in Portland. Uh, so those types of things that our legislators will be wrestling with are important for our personal security and for our personal privacy, uh, that little tiny little buzzers around don't come through our windows and don't peek in with their little cameras and invade our personal privacy and that our law enforcement people don't uh, over abuse uh, authorities by using these types of uh, aircraft. Uh, I want to talk particularly about uh, our U.S. military and the use of drones in our military and I'm, I'm glad Brian mentioned this whole issue of the ethical boundaries. And he's, uh, you know, he's been right in the middle of it, both on the military side at China Lake and now on the civilian side of it. And for our military, it is one of the great growth industries, probably the greatest technological movement um, of the last decade, as it is in our commercial uh, sphere, too. Um, but I'm very concerned that there will be a, a bleed over from what I believe are unethical uses for those military drones, the bleed over into the civilian use of them. And we certainly know that uh, our country is uh, uh, the leader in the use of assassin drones, that it is a national policy of the United States that we use this type of aircraft for tar targeted assassinations, targeted executions, and that we do know that the, the legal and ethical boundaries of this um, really call into question some of the roles that our senior leaders of our country have. Uh, their, their legal roles, for example, right now our President of the United States as uh, has taken on the role of being the chief prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner uh, when he, on Terror Tuesdays, takes the list of persons that our intelligence agencies, the 16 intelligence agencies that we have in the, on the federal level, when they give him a list of people that they feel should die, that they have done something uh, that is jeopardizing U.S. national interests somewhere. And it is so bad that, well, first, that it's so bad that we, the people, can't know how bad it is. So we never know exactly what the President of the United States sees as the evidence that somebody should die for what they have done. But the President, on Terror Tuesday, makes a determination on who is going to be killed, who is going to be executed out of that list. 
So I think the President of the United States has certainly over, overstepped his boundary on uh, what he is by law uh, able to do. And as we've seen in other administrations, as senior leaders start overstepping their boundaries on things, it, it kind of flows downhill. If the President can get away with it, if the General can get away with it, if the so-and-so can get away with it, then more and more people in our society feel they can get away with something. And, so I, I'm very concerned that this type of attitude will bleed on over into uh, our civilian environment. And when our law enforcement agencies uh, on the local level, I mean, they, law enforcement on the national level already have them. The FBI already has uh, major drones. The Customs Service has major drones. So far, to my knowledge, they're not weaponized here in the United States. Um, but they easily can be. And then when it comes down to the Portland City uh, law enforcement, the Portland police or the Oregon Highway Patrol, and when they start asking for the permission to put, well, let's see, what could you put on a little drone? Could you put a little shotgun, shotgun shells coming off of it? Can you put a tear gas canister, a grenade launcher? Um, and then, What's the next step uh, using those things and who has the authority? So I, I really am concerned first at our national level that we've overstepped the, the ethical uh, boundaries in this weapon system that has caused um, actually the United States to endanger its own national security by this type of a, of a weapon. I've, I myself have been to Afghanistan and Pakistan and Yemen uh, three places where the United States is using uh, weaponized drones and targeted assassinations. And I've talked with government leaders, I've talked with uh, families of victims of drones, um, I've talked to average people in all of those countries about their concern about these, the use of these drones. And I will just say that I don't believe the image of the United States has been enhanced by the use of these that indeed people all over the world are, uh, are furious with the United States because uh, like most weapon systems, they aren't nearly as precise as our military hopes they will be, thinks they will be. You know, we've just seen in, uh, in Gaza uh, 1,800 people that have been killed. Uh, the, the use of drones by the Israeli military, they're, they're really second in the use of drones. I think the United States still is number one, but Israel has 24 hour a day coverage of Gaza with drones. And if the statistics hold true from 2012 and the Israeli attack on Gaza then, where over one third of the people that were killed were killed by, uh, by drone, uh, drone rockets, that we can see that there are going to be uh, uh, hundreds probably eight, I would say probably about 800 people when it, all this, the analysis is done have probably been killed by, by those drones. Some of them probably were militants, but as we see on the last day before the ceasefire, going after militants, three on a motorcycle, and blowing people up right in front of a heavily, civil, an area where lots of civilians are, where 10 civilians were killed, where 50 were wounded that these types of weapon systems uh, have blowback. They have big blowback. And I think the blowback of the United States, where we see that um, in Afghanistan, that in the last two years, there have been more US military people that have been killed by Afghan soldiers than have been killed by the Taliban. And this week alone, we see that American general five more American soldiers, four more uh, NATO soldiers, and I believe a German general were wounded. Um, many people are saying that the probability that these attacks on US military and NATO forces are being done by people in the Afghan army who come from the areas, the regions where uh, the US drones have been used the most on the Pakistani border. So I think it's something that we need to really look at in terms of uh, the policies that we have. Um, 
first in the, the military, but as they flow on over into civilian use, that we have to be very, very careful about the use of this type of technology and the abuse of this type of technology. Thank you. I think what's clear here tonight from all the panelists is you know, we in Oregon have a wonderful opportunity because the legislature has an unwritten script at this point about what we're going to do uh, with private citizens uh, and the use of drones. Uh, as Representative Williamson pointed out, we have created last session a system which at least requires warrants for public entities in most circumstances to do surveillance of citizens. But uh, as Brian told us, there really is no regulatory system currently in place for private citizens, uh, whether they be hobbyists uh, or corporations uh, or, or any of us. And so our goal, uh, Oregonians for Drone Control formed last summer, and it's a group of various organizations, some of which were our sponsors tonight, uh, and, a, and a bunch of, of dedicated citizens, but it's a small group of us. And one of the reasons we wanted to put on this forum uh, was A, to educate all of us from some national and local experts on the subject, uh, but B, we really would like to get more people involved here in our community. Mitch Swecker uh, is here in the audience. He is the head of the Oregon Department of Aviation. Uh, can you stand up, Mitch, just real quick? And we didn't touch on this directly, I don't think, but, at, or I might have been outside if we did, but Mitch is actually going to be putting a report together uh, for Representative Williamson and the Judiciary Committees of the Senate and the House talking about what we should do for private citizens and, and regulation of drones. And that was one of the reasons we wanted to have a forum and a public discussion uh, is so we as the citizens can have some input uh, on what we'd like to see. And I think that's gonna require us rolling up our sleeves and doing some lobbying. Uh, pushing to get a good bill written, that's what we're gonna be doing, uh, hopefully with Representative Williamson and some of the other uh, folks there at the legislative le uh, level. And I think one thing we've heard across the panel tonight is this isn't a left-right issue, it is all of us issue. Uh, you know, we all are involved with this. We all face surveillance. We all could have neighbors uh, or coworkers or uh, bosses uh, that, that are going to be implementing this robotic technology. And I think it's critical that we start to have this discussion. And as I said earlier, try to make ourselves here in Oregon a model for the nation uh, by coming up with great legislation that is thinking 5, 10, 20 years down the road, like we heard the panelists talking about here tonight. This is, uh, you know, a few days ago is the 100th anniversary of the beginning of uh, one of the, well, the two biggest uh, global slaughters of uh, history of the planet, the first big, really highly mechanized war. And uh, the memorials that are going on around Europe and Australia and elsewhere and will be happening here in the U.S. in a couple of years, you know, they focus a lot on the numbers of people killed um, and one of the things I think they don't focus on is uh, the numbers of people who resisted the war and who knew that it was going to kill that many people uh, it wasn't something they needed to figure out afterwards years ago today the arms race was at an end if there was a soul alive who could begin to comprehend the suffering to follow the hell that would transpire when the soldiers were lined up and the men began to fire a hundred years ago today all around the world there were hordes of marching men with flags of empire unfurled there was the opposition who wouldn't stay on bended knee who said we'll fight for neither king nor kaiser neither god nor country a hundred years ago today the streets were filled to bursts 
with millions of people who said they had no thirst for the blood of other workers who lived across the sea. They said, we'll fight for neither king nor kaiser, neither god nor country. A hundred years ago today, referendums were ignored. Democracy was something no empire could afford. Sedition laws were passed and they filled the penitentiaries. We'll fight for neither king nor kaiser, neither god nor country. A hundred years ago today, executions were at dawn. Bomb blasts filled the air. The battle lines were drawn, the muddy fields were all red. A voice echoed amid the bodies. We'll fight for neither king nor kaiser, neither god nor country. We'll fight for neither king nor kaiser, neither god nor country. We'll fight for neither king nor kaiser, neither god nor country.